Hello again, ladies, and thanks for joining us for another week in our series, Let Us. I hope you're enjoying it. I, I know I really am. We're having fun recording this, and I'm getting already reports of how well the group discussions are going. So I, I just exhort you to keep with this because we're going to grow together. Remember, we are a sisterhood, and we're in this together, right? So let's continue. Uh, I always like to do a brief recap. Uh, the fact of the matter is the motivation for this series, it led us, is because we all face those pressures uh, from within as well as from without. And they become, uh, if we're not careful, dangerous to our faith walk. Uh, we, can, we can lose sight of Jesus in the process. And we don't want to do that. And so it really is necessary for us to look into the Word. And what we're doing during this series is looking particularly in the book of Hebrews, where uh, like 12 different times he exhorts, let us. And so, so far, we've been looking at let us fear lest the promise of entering his rest we miss, just like the Israelites did. And the other one was, let us therefore labor to enter into his rest. We also looked at, let us draw near to God. Oh, what a privilege it is, friends, to draw near to God. We have an open invitation. Amen. So, Today, we are going to examine two more Let Us exhortations from the book of Hebrews, and both of those are going to be found in the following passage. I'm going to read from Hebrews 4, verses 14 to 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Now, they each have some good points to consider, so I'm going to elaborate on each one separately. So let's look at the first one. Let us hold firmly to the faith. Starting off in faith is a good thing. Staying in faith is a great thing. Now, friends, I got to tell you, when I was pondering, let us hold firmly, I, I was trying to picture an illustration. And I have to tell you, a very funny story came to my mind that I'm going to share with you. This was way back when we were living in Fort Lauderdale, and my sister Nancy uh, at that time was a young adult with a group of friends, and they did a whole lot of different things together. Well, one Sunday afternoon after church, a bunch of them decided to go out into the Atlantic Ocean with a friend who had a boat. While they were out there, uh, somehow seaweed got tangled up into the propeller. And so the owner of the boat said he had to go overboard and under there to try to untangle. But he noticed that they were drifting closer and closer to a sandbar. So he asked for a volunteer to get out of the boat into the water and at the bow of the boat and hold on to the boat so that it wouldn't go into the sandbar, okay, and damage the boat and they'd be stuck and costly to remove them and so forth. Well, as my sister puts it, the one woman didn't know how to swim <laughs> on a boat. Uh, I, I don't understand that. But anyway, even with a life vest on, she did not want to get out of the boat. The other one in the boat was deathly afraid of sharks. So 
Nancy, my sister, said, well, I'm not afraid of sharks and I can swim. So she got out of the boat and was hanging on to the bow of the boat. Well, this lasted for like 45 minutes to an hour. And all of those waves in the Atlantic Ocean, there are waves. And as the waves would come, I laugh every time I picture it, guys. <laughs> The, the wave would toss her up, her legs would go out, and she was hanging on firmly to the bow of the boat. And then it would crash down and she'd go under the water, but she was still hanging firmly to that boat. Meanwhile, we're at church Sunday night wondering, where are all of those people? Well, they finally made it. And of course, you look back at things like that and you think, man, when we were young, we did some really crazy stuff. That could have been very dangerous. Nevertheless, Less, her illustration, I think, works very well with what we're dealing with today. Let us hold firmly to our faith. Amen. There are two things that can help us to hold firmly to the faith. First, Christ, as our high priest, understands our weaknesses. That's so good. And he's sympathetic to helping us. We don't have to be alone, friends, because he is our advocate to the Father. And then the second point, the second thing, Christ gives us his own example. We see that in the wilderness temptation that we're going to look at in just a moment. If there is one thing the Bible is clear about, it's that faith has to be exercised in order for us to stay firm in it. The Bible teaches us that when we're tempted, God is willing to help us. Christ faced temptation and beat it, and what he used is available to us at all times. Let's get real. People quit when they feel they're alone or no one understands. It's a horrible feeling, friends, when you think you or something important to you won't succeed. And I'm sure you've said it or you've heard it. I'm never going to lose this weight. I'm never going to get in shape. My marriage is doomed. Nothing's ever going to change. I'll never get that promotion. I'm never going to get that college degree. I think you, you've said that or heard it. So often we feel God doesn't understand the pressures that we go through. But Jesus came in human flesh so that there would be a way for him to feel what we're going through, to know our human weaknesses. God didn't stay out of harm's way. He faced it squarely so he can help us through the storms of life and when we feel that our faith is slipping. There's a story told, I think it was in the 1800s, of an English painter by the name of Joseph Turner. He invited his friend to come and see his most recent painting that he called The Storm at Sea. His friend looked at it and he like was in awe of how realistic it was. He captured the essence of a storm at sea. And he asked the painter, how did you do it? Well, Joseph Turner told him he actually engaged a fisherman and told him he wanted to go out on the boat with this fisherman when a storm was coming. Well, the day came that a storm was brewing, and so they went out on the boat. He had the fisherman bind him, tie him to the mast, and then steer straight into the storm. Now, when he was experiencing that and, uh, and those waves crashing against him and the force of the wind, he longed to go below where it was secure and he could be safe and dry. But he couldn't because he was bound to that mast. He not only saw the storm, he felt it. It blew right into him to the point that he actually became a part of the storm. And so he told his friend when he was back on land, he went to his studio and put that experience on canvas. That is a powerful illustration of what Jesus did for us in experiencing the storms that we go through. Listen to what Hebrews 2 verse 18 says in the Message Bible. It's obvious, of course, that he didn't go to all this trouble for angels. It was for people like us, children of Abraham. That's why he had to enter into every detail of human life. Then, when he came before God as high priest to get rid of the people's sins, he would have already experienced it 
all himself, all the pain, all the testing, and would be able to help where help was needed. Let's take a closer look at those three temptations that Jesus faced, and that's found in Matthew 4, verses 1 to 11. We're not going to look at all of those for the sake of time, but I'm just going to touch on each of those. The first temptation was to turn the stone into bread to satisfy his natural hunger. That was after he had fasted for 40 days. Natural bread at that time wasn't supposed to be his focus, though. Jesus was about to begin his ministry, his earthly ministry. So this temptation was to lose focus from a spiritual one to a natural one. <clears throat> this, friends, is going to be a constant struggle that we all face so long as we are living on this earth. Christ's security was not in physical bread. It was in the Word of God. He used the Word of God to beat this temptation, and so can we. Amen? Here's another temptation, to choose the spectacular rather than the scripture. Jesus' main focus, though, of his ministry was repent and be saved. I think about Billy Graham. He never is known for spectacular miracles, yet millions were saved under his ministry. Satan's other temptation to Jesus was to wow the crowds. Jesus' miracles did, in fact, attract the crowd, the spectacular, okay? But they never kept them for long. As soon as Jesus began to teach repentance and faith, to give a glass of water, to visit the sick or those in prison, to clothe the naked, to forgive others, to tithe, that's when the crowds left. Miracles are not a guarantee that something is right. But the message of God's word about Jesus Christ is always right. The final temptation, the third one, <clears throat> was a desire for a shortcut. In essence, for Jesus to be Lord over all of the kingdoms and that immediately. This temptation was to avoid all the suffering, the day-by-day -day efforts, all the routine servanthood stuff. Just take the kingdoms now. The temptation here is to see the ordinary as somehow not the extraordinary, but it is, friends. Every time you go through life in the day-by-day -day stuff of life, you are being extraordinary. If, you, if everything that you do, you desire to bring glory to God, it's extraordinary. So don't ever limit what you are doing in the name of Christ. This temptation to take a shortcut is very real, and many people take it today. There are no shortcuts, friends, to holy living. It takes effort, daily routine serving, faithfulness over long periods of time. It takes time and work to build a healthy ministry, to be a healthy Christian, to do a fruitful work for God. It doesn't come in an instant. This is how we hold firmly to the faith. So, people lose their firm faith when two things happen. They think they're alone without help, and they lose focus on Christ. But Jesus' remedy is he is able to understand us, and he offers help, and he shows us by example how to keep the focus. In the time remaining, let's look at the second one. Let us therefore come boldly to God's throne. This verse tells us to come confidently to God, telling him our needs, knowing that grace is there, help is ready. When we pray, we need to make sure we approach God as believers, not as beggars. We are God's children. We are not castaways. We can approach God with confident courage because of our high priest's sympathy, because of our trust in his intercession and salvation. The writer of Hebrews and other chapters warned the believers not to revert back to the old ways, which was the Levitical system. It was with fear and trepidation that they approached the Lord, thinking they still had to go through an earthly priest. There is a way that we should approach God, and it's by the blood of Jesus that we are granted the right of approach. Jesus provided a better way. Hallelujah. So 
when when you look at the Old Testament tabernacle and the temple, there was a veil that separated the holy place from the holy of holies. Only the high priest could go into the holy of holies, and that was only once a year, okay? But Hebrews 10.20 talks about the veil being his flesh. Jesus made a new way for us to approach God. Isn't that exciting, friends? There's no need then to be timid in approaching God. The blood of Jesus assures us that when we approach God, we will be received. When we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we enter into a covenant relationship. One of the covenant names of God is Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord, my righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5 tells us that because Jesus became the sin offering for us, we became righteous. What good news. It's through no act of our own that God considers us righteous. When I approach God, friends, it's with the knowledge that he he doesn't see me with all my faults and shortcomings. No, friends, he sees Jesus. I am washed in the blood of the Lamb. I'm a new creation. He, uh, Ephesians 1 reminds us we are accepted in the Beloved. The Levitical system was incapable of offering lasting assurance, but we who are under the blood can come with much assurance for the following reasons. Christ intercedes for us while he is seated on the throne next to the Father. Romans 8, 34 tells us, who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. That certainty, friends, should give us boldness, amen, in our approach to God and in our prayers. The second thought is the Lord saves us to the uttermost. Hebrews 7.25, therefore he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. We should always be mindful that it is he who forgives and grants us access into his presence. So we should reverently approach God's throne. In other words, be sure to keep the balance. Stay respectful, but be bold. Approach God with confidence and recognize your need for grace. Believe that he delights in your prayers and he is ready to answer any request that is in accordance with his will. You know, I feel like it would be a great way for us to close today if you would repeat a prayer with me. So say this after me. Thank you, God, for understanding me and not condemning me. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for shedding your blood, giving me access to the Father. Thank you for the assurance that you are interceding for me. Thank you for not giving up on me. I ask for your help that I may be more understanding like you are. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, ladies. Thanks for joining us today. Make sure you stay with your discussion groups. We are in this together, and together we can help each other. God bless.